First Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm going to cover verses 6 to 10 today. Uh, first, verses 6 to 10. Uh, if you're brand new, maybe joining us for the first time today, or maybe even brand new and not super familiar with Scripture and with the Word, let me take a minute or two for a brief context to help us better understand the text that we're reading today. This is a letter written by a man by the name of Paul primarily, but with his Paul and company, if you will, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And they, they arrive in a city in Macedonia at its time, known as Macedonia, now modern-day Greek. Greece, and uh, they plant a church in Thessalonica. And in a few short weeks, they're run out of town because the city's uh, thrown in an uproar. And so Paul, as he continues to move from city to city and plant churches, continues to wonder about this small little group of believers in this city that he only had a few short weeks with to disciple and begin to teach them what does it mean to follow hard after Jesus. And so the letter is just filled with his love and his concern and his care for them. You'll see that in our text again today. Uh, but, but also he answers, we'll see this in a couple of weeks, some questions that they had, especially regarding people that had passed on or had died who were followers of Jesus, what happens to them. So he writes this letter to encourage them. He writes this letter to strengthen their faith. He writes this letter to give them hope in the return, ultimately, of Jesus Christ. Uh, last week, we read in the previous verses of chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, that Paul says, as he's writing to these, these young children in the faith, he's like, like when, when I and when we could stand it no longer, we had to do something. So he says, we send Timothy. Obviously, Paul and Silas w- it would have been trouble. They were more recognizable. They were probably the front men in the uproar uh, that the city had launched against them. And so they send Timothy back to the church. They're in a different city now, and they sent Athens, and they send Timothy back. And Timothy is there, Paul says, and this is important to note because you're going to see this come full circle in our text today. He says, I'm sending him to you for the primary purpose of strengthening and encouraging your faith so that you won't be unsettled by the trials that you're going through as a follower of Jesus, all right? So I'm sending him to strengthen and encourage you in the middle of the trials that you're currently experiencing. All right, so now we pick it up, and, he, and at the end of verse 5, he says, so that the tempter doesn't tempt you to fall away from this faith that you hold in Jesus. Now, look at verse 6, and I'm just going to go verse by verse, one verse at a time, 6 through 10, and then we're going to finish taking our communion together today, and we have a baptism, at least one scheduled. We might have a few more spirit-scheduled baptisms as well, too, and we look forward to that. Uh, verse 6, Paul goes on to say, but Timothy has just now come to us from you. So in the previous few verses, he sends Timothy, and he's right, we sent Timothy to you. And so by the time, again, you got to remember in this day, travel, how long it took, communication. By the time Timothy spend, gets to the city, spends time in the church, and comes back to Paul, they're now in a different city called Corinth. Uh, we have two letters to that church, Corinthians. So he says, Timothy has just now come to us from you. Now watch this. And has brought good news. Timothy came with good news. What was the good news that Paul says, and he interpreted, and he received as good news? Well, it was about your faith and your love. Remember, what was the reason why he sent Timothy? To strengthen and encourage them in their faith. Timothy comes back, and if I may, says to Paul, they're doing great. Their faith is alive. They haven't caved in to the testing and the persecution. They're standing in the faith. Their faith is... And look, it's not just an an intellectual pursuit of knowledge, right? Because faith always is expressed in our actions. And so he says that they have this faith, but then you can see the faith playing out in their lives through the love that they have for each other and the love that they have for God. And Paul says, man, he brought us good news about you people. You're encouraging me. Interestingly enough... The word that Paul uses that we get in our English translates good news is one that is used almost everywhere in the New Testament for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. It literally carries the word evangelism or evangelist in the actual Greek word itself. In fact, it is used primarily and specifically for proclaiming and preaching the gospel of Jesus. And Paul's like, 
you're bringing the gospel, the good news to me. And why, why would he use that word that's attached to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's like Paul is saying the gospel is still being received and is still being effective in your lives. And as a result, it is still good news. Can we just say something today? Like the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a one and done piece of good news. Like, hey, it's good news that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and was born and he lived and he died and he rose from the dead. Like, that was good news back then. It's still good news today. When we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and our spiritual eyes are opened in faith to see Jesus for who he really is and we say yes and accept his gift of eternal life and salvation, it's good news in that moment. But can I say to us, As we live every day of our life, it's still good news. We're good news carriers, right? Like, like think about it. We're good news carriers of the gospel of Jesus. So a good question for us to ask ourselves is how are we carrying and displaying the good news of Jesus? How are we carrying and displaying the good news of Jesus? Is it it encouraging to others? Is it uplifting their faith when they see how you and I live our lives, especially in times of trying and times of testing? Paul goes on to say in verse 7, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all... Now watch this. I love this how the tables are turned from the previous few verses. Paul says, In all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Now remember, he sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage their faith in the midst of trials, right? That was verses one through five. Now Timothy comes back, and what does Timothy do with Paul and Silas? He strengthens and encourages their faith while they're in the middle of persecutions and trials in the city of Corinth. Do you see like how that like, A a, a life lived standing firm in the faith of Jesus. We'll see this phrase in the next verse. Like, it is mutually edifying and encouraging. Like, we literally have the capacity to encourage each other um, in the way in which we live for, pursue, and go after the heart of Jesus with our lives, and especially in times of trials. And that doesn't mean that we don't have days where we feel it and we feel the weight and we struggle more than others. Those are real. We're human. They happen. But consistently in and out, when we even in those moments make a decision to continue to posture our heart after Jesus, it is an encouragement to somebody. And Paul's like, Timothy came back and he encouraged us while we're in the middle of our trials, while we're in the middle of our persecutions, which was fascinating to me. Now look at verse eight. And in my studies and my thoughts today, sort of the primary thrust that I want to focus on, I believe is found in verse eight. There's so many different ways we could go, but to me, there's just some things the Lord really challenged me with. And I want to challenge you with as well too. Verse eight, he says, again, remember what he's heard, how it's made him feel, how I'm encouraged. Look what he says here. For now we really live. For now we really live. I'll explain that here in just a second. He goes on to say, since you are standing firm in the Lord. I don't think for a second Paul was just, you know, blowing some hot air the way the Thessalonians to make them feel good about themselves. He's saying, we are really living now that we know how you're doing. I mean, it just just shows his tender heart, how he cared for people, how he cared for his children in the Lord. He's like, now we live. Now, Now, let me draw your attention to what Paul says here of standing firm. Because this is what he says really makes, 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 like he's got a bounce in his step now. Because he finds out that these new believers are standing firm in the Lord. What exactly does that, the word here, standing firm, means to stand fast, to stand firm, to persevere. The way it is written means that it is an ongoing lifestyle, a present reality. So hence, in the English from the Greek, we get the translation that you are standing firm in the Lord. 
not a past tense. It's present and it's active, which means it's ongoing in their life at the very moment Paul's writing this letter. Like you are daily and consistently standing firm in the Lord. You're standing fast. You're persevering in all these things that you're going through. And uh, I love one of our elders, Rick Lessing, a mentor of mine as well too, just the wisdom that God has given him. Uh, we share things back and forth. And he shares things with me about much, much more understanding that he has about the original language and things. So he was sharing some things about this particular uh, part of the verse here. These next two thoughts are influenced by him. Um, he said, this word is developed from a word in the Greek, which simply means to stand just to stand in place. Now, now notice this because it takes on a little bit more of a meaning. The word accentuates the idea of standing to convey digging one's feet in the ground for better support. Thus, to be dug in, entrenched, nearly unmovable. So, the, I mean, th this is not the most adequate analogy, but if you get the picture, if you've ever been to the beach, um, which I'm going to assume most of you have, if you haven't, go to the beach. And I'm not talking about some beach on a lake. I'm talking about the beach. That's like pseudo beach, fake beach. Real beach is on an ocean. Sorry if I made you mad. Get over it. Jesus loves you. We will... Go out on the sand where the water's just sort of lapping. And if you've ever done, and you just sort of dig your feet in. Have you ever done that? Am I just me? Anybody? Okay. So, all right. So, all right. <laughs> yes, Lillian, thank you for reminding us. You just spent 36 days down in Florida. We, wasn't, you weren't at the beach? Oh, okay. She didn't go to the beach, by the way. But when I'm at the beach, I'll do it. And I'll just, you just dig your feet in and your, your, your feet, and then they start sinking down in the sand. And you just try and stand there against the waves. As they make, and that's like, that's like the word picture that Paul says here about these people with their faith. I, I just sort of came across that and just my mind just went with this. They're, they're digging their feet into the Lord. So I, I think based upon what we know about holding fast to Jesus, like I can say these, these next few things. Well, Paul sort of mentions it throughout the letter. It's also implied that these individuals, their identity was grounded in the Lord. Their identity. Now remember, these individuals, Paul says in the letter, like they had, they were serving idols. And they had turned from serving idols to loving Jesus. Can you imagine how the evil one would attack them and try and drag their identity back to their past? Remember what you did? Remember what you sacrificed to these gods? Uh, did these gods ever persecute you and allow you to go through the trials that you're going through now that you're suffering for this so-called Savior Jesus? And when those lies came, what did they do? They just dug their feet and they grounded their identity in the Lord. They, they grounded their purpose in the Lord. They grounded their faith. Paul repeatedly talks about their faith. They grounded their faith in the Lord. They dug into it. They grounded their love into the Lord. And when we grind, dig, and, and dig into our loving the Lord, it, it cannot help but then flow out to the way we love people. Um, their hope was grounded in the Lord. And we'll see that in the next chapter because they asked him questions like they wanted hope, and he gives them hope in Jesus. That Their hope was in the Lord that he had come, that he had lived, that he had died, that he had resurrected. And their hope was that he was coming back. And they dug their feet into that. And they said, we'll stand fast in the middle of these trials and their testings. So I wrote this question as I was thinking through this. And I asked, I asked this to you to seriously stop for a second, and how do you answer this question? Where are you digging your feet into? Where are you digging your feet into? Where are you standing firm? Where's your hope? I want you to be honest and real before the Lord today with the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't play church games. Like, be real. Where's your hope? 
That's, that's what I'm asking. Because Paul said they stood firm in the Lord because their hope was in the Lord. Where's your hope? It's interesting, Paul didn't say, I'm so encouraged that you're standing firm in going to church every Sunday with the other believers. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. But that's not what he said they were standing firm in. He didn't say, I'm so encouraged that you're faithful in giving of your tithes and offerings to the church there, so you stand firm in that. He said, you're digging your feet into the Lord. Where's your hope? What are you digging into? Can I, can I just lob this your way? If you're placing your hope into something that is earthly, then in love I share with you, that is a false hope. And I share that in love from a pastor's heart. Why? Can I tell you something? No matter what that is, if it's your money, if it's your skills, if it's your home or your homes, if it's your power, if it's your authority, can I just tell you something? I just did a funeral Friday. I'm going to talk about it. Can I tell you? You don't take any of that with you. None of it goes with you. Absolutely none of it. Why would your hope be there? See, these people understood the eternal purpose that they had in Jesus, even though they had much more to learn. And we'll see that in the next verse. Like they had a lot more to learn. But it's fascinating to me. Listen, listen to me, church. It's fascinating to me that believers who are literally months old in their faith and have strong trials and testing coming against them, and they just decide to dig their feet into Jesus, and we're not going anywhere, and we're going to stand firm. And in 2022, if I'm being honest, some of us has such a weak need faith that just the slightest little difficulty causes us to turn and walk away. Like, where is this kind of faith in us? Where are we to say, no, I'm going to dig in. Give me a shovel so I can dig deeper into Jesus. I want my roots to just be just like the roots just wrapped around my feet and all the way up so that nothing, and I mean nothing, can move me. And then as a church, we are so so firmly rooted and grounded in Jesus and the word of God and loving people that nothing in culture is going to sway us from ever proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Like stand firm. What are you digging into? What are you holding on to? Maybe God brought you here today in love. Can I, in, God does this in love. Yes, he works in a gentle whisper. Yeah, but sometimes he also rocks our world. And maybe right now he's just in love, just sort of rocking your world a little bit. And you're sitting there thinking, holy smack, is that dude right? What if he's right? I don't think he's right. They can't be right. I've heard about this religion. Is this, no, what if he's right? What if it's real? Okay, okay, so let me ask, what if it's real? Don't you see the love of God for you to bring you here today to hear the truth so that today you can dig your feet into Jesus for the first time ever by saying, I profess that I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God, that I believe what the scriptures teach, that Jesus came to the earth and he lived a life unlike mine and that he never sinned. And I believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross for my sins, every single one of them, and that Jesus cross paid the penalty for my sins that, that have literally caused me and, and put a death mark on me that the wages of sin is death but praise God the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and today you will dig your feet into Jesus and Jesus will pour his spirit into you and you can get baptized and you can declare before the church today like Jason last week at the end of the 11 o'clock service he couldn't leave the service because the Holy Spirit said now is your time Jason and Jason came down here and we celebrated that he dug his feet into Jesus through salvation and believers baptism like today in just a few moments, don't hesitate. Why? He's like, dude, why are you so passionate? A, this is how I'm wired. Secondly, because you're, if the scriptures are right, and we believe they are, your eternal destiny hangs in the balance. That's why I'm so passionate. We just care enough about that. 
And we want you to experience the unbelievable love of Jesus and the peace and the hope that you have to stand firm in him no matter what life throws through you. Okay, Landon, come on, real quick. So this morning, I was just in my mind thinking through this, and, and I couldn't help but just immediately what came to my mind was a beautiful hymn of the faith. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. If you're digging your feet into something else, your hope into something else, that's sinking sand. But when you dig your feet into Jesus, that's a solid rock that changes your, absolutely changes your eternal destiny. So I just want us, if you're familiar with it, sing it. If you're not, receive it. If you're investigating, listen deeply. And may the Spirit open up your eyes of faith as we just declare this truth about Jesus Christ, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest fruit, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other crown. Is sinking sand, all other grounds is sinking sand. Yeah, let's just sing his oath, his covenant, his blood. His oath, his covenant, his blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul keeps wet, He then is all my hope and stay. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now, there's a final verse. And it's where the ultimate hope lies. And if your hope is in your money, you can't sing this verse. If your hope is in another person, you can't, if your hope is in your spouse, you, you can't in truth declare this verse. If your hope is in your job and some authority or influence that you wield, you can't sing this verse. But when your hope is in Jesus, like this is our ultimate hope. This is what causes us to stand firm in the deepest, darkest seasons of our life. And some of you are experiencing that right now. So I challenge you, we sing this last verse. Either sing it or just let it be sung over you because it starts when Christ shall come. You know that one? Okay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is seeking. Sing that again. And on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is seeking sand. All other ground is seeking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. But Christ is a solid rock. Don't leave here today on sinking sand. Heck, get up right now. I see Tiffany and I see Josiah back there. They're ready to meet with you, talk with you, some of our elders. And today, you publicly declare that your faith and hope is standing firm on Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me finish these two verses. Whew. Thanks. Why do you, every time you play, I cry. I don't know what's up with you, man. Gosh. 
So I love how Rick said this, that Timothy did an on-site assessment of the situation in Thessalonica, and he rated it a five-star situation. The Thessalonians were not just surviving, they were thriving in the Lord. They were thriving in the Lord. And so because of this, Paul says, now we really live. It gives him a burst of new life. There was a new spring in his step. He could pour himself wholeheartedly into the work at the church in Corinth because he knew that the people in Thessalonica were standing firm. It was on Christ, the solid rock they were standing. Nothing else and no one else. I love how Rick said, since the Thessalonians thrive, then that gives Paul a drive in ministry and even his quality of life. <laughs> That's how impactful our standing firm in the faith can be to others. Verse 9, Paul says this, two verses left. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Paul is joyfully thankful for these people. How can we thank God enough, he says, there's his thankfulness, for the joy we have because of you joyfully thankful because of them and because of their faith and because of their love for God and their love for each other. And then we close with this verse right here. Night and day we pray. That's fascinating to me because I'll be honest, I don't pray night and day usually. It's usually one or the other. But night and day, I mean, this guy was like prayer was just, prayer was just a natural part of his life. Night and day we pray, most earnestly, he says, that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. And that most earnestly uh, literally means very, very exceedingly. If you did a straight translation from the Greek, very, very exceedingly. It's earnestness and enthusiasm in praying before the Lord, giving thanks for these people and for their faith and what they mean to him. And what were his prayers for? That we may see you again and that we may supply what is lacking in your faith. And that's simply saying like, I just didn't get to teach you enough and share enough about Jesus. And so I want to come back and there's so much more to know about this, this incredible man, this son of God and what he means for your life. And I want to come back and be able to teach you. So Paul was encouraged by a message of hope Timothy brought him. He was encouraged by other believers' faith and love. And I want to share with you that I've experienced that personally this week by the life and prayers of one of our dear saints of this church. And I hope in my closing comment to encourage you as well by her faith and love in Jesus. Carol Zook, a longtime member, about as close as a charter member as you can get to Pine Hills, passed away on Friday, March the 4th. March the 4th. She was an amazing, amazing woman. Married for 49 years, would have been 50 in July. Taught kindergarten for 34 years, I believe. So many extra crowns in heaven for that. And, if, and I, told the, I told the people at the funeral Friday, if ever there was an individual wired to teach kindergartners, it was Carol Zook. She was absolutely amazing. So we had her celebration of life on Friday. And during the week, I met with her husband, Vaughn, and I've, I've known Carol for 16 years. She taught my kids in Sunday school. She's taught many of your kids when she was here earlier in the years when she taught. And I sat with Vaughn, and he, he gave me some things. She was a writer, and so he gave me some of the devotionals she wrote, and he also gave me a prayer journal he had bought for her a few years ago. And he said, I'd like you to read some of these things because it just gives you a window to her soul. And he said, feel free to use anything that you'd like. So I have permission from him to do this. And so being encouraged by another believer's faith, that's what happens in this text. And so I, I want to hopefully encourage you like I was encouraged by Carol Zook's faith. This first, first part was from her prayer journal. And I think it's such a testimony to all of us. But if I may, I feel compelled to speak, especially to seasoned adults in the room, because Carol herself was a seasoned adult when she wrote this. And I just love the passionate pursuit of her heart that she hasn't checked out. So here's what she said, quote, Dear Abba Father, I'm glad that I can tell you my troubles and that I know you listen and care. My health is my big concern right now. My right arm, my tummy, my right ear rubbing against my hearing aid. I know that our body gets weaker over time. Please see me through the process of aging. It's hard. 
Please help me be the best that I can be for as long as you plan. And help me to glorify your name until my last breath. And I can testify, Carol Zook glorified Jesus. She stayed firm in her faith until her last breath down in a hospital in Florida. There's also something that she wrote in her prayer journal that was so encouraging to me. And so I hope you're encouraged as well. And it comes under the heading of, from Jeremiah that says, Seek me with your whole heart. She said, Dear Father, this seems like a natural thing, but it is... Tell me if you don't relate to this. Seems like a natural thing, but it is not as easy to do as it might seem. Things get in the way. Energy isn't as high as it should be. I need you so much. I need to make time to pray to you while I'm not tired. I need to focus on my prayers rather than let my mind wander off because of something I thought about while I was praying. Please help me make you the most important thing in my life. Help me to always put you first. Give me the strength to put all of my energy into the activities you want me to do. I really get upset with myself when my mind wanders when I'm praying. I know that you understand and love me. Help me to seek you more and to see you more. Let me discover you in even the most simple things. Just the simple things. Someday, I want to hear you say, well done. To me. But I don't think I'm worthy of that now. Thank you for not giving up on me. I need you so much. And I'll propose to you that Carol has heard those words. And in fact, what the scriptures say is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. She stood firm in the faith. Paul was encouraged by the Thessalonians. We're encouraged by those who live with us, by those who have gone on before us. We have the capacity to encourage others standing firm in the face, faith, but it's only by digging our feet into Jesus and standing firm on him as our solid rock, 